It is said we are currently living in the midst of a third black renaissance. The first was in the 1920s, the so-called Harlem Renaissance. Our next story is about the second, in the 1960s, the civil rights and black power era. And we don't have to go to Harlem for this story. We recently ran a documentary about BAG, B-A-G, the Black Artists Group, a group of African-American musicians and artists here in the city. Ruthie Zell recently caught up with the director and asked him why he thought it important to tell their story. This is just such an important story. This is something that people need to know. And being in St. Louis and seeing that I had access to some of the key players in the story, um, it was, I guess, a little bit, it just seemed uh, like it had to happen. You know, you've got the avenue here, start reaching out, start talking to people that were here during that period that were part of the BAG organization. And uh, let's just, since I have the gear, let's get the camera rolling and let's see what we can do. Well, you must be a music lover or this would not have interested you. That's definitely what drew me in. Um, you know, I was researching albums and I came across a top 10 list and they listed the Black Artist Group album. The Live in Paris album is one of the top 10 experimental jazz albums of all time. And seeing the St. Louis connection and not being aware of the organization or the group, I was just instantly drawn in. So it started with the record and then when I saw how much larger that story was, I just had to proceed. In the film, it talks about how they, they couldn't get venues to perform in because people didn't understand what they were doing. Mm -hmm. And so they would just play anywhere. They would find ways to play, uh, whether it was at Forest Park, um, you know, or a few small venues around that would allow them to play. But I think what's really cool there also is if you look at how they ended up opening their headquarters on 2665 Washington Avenue. You know, that became not only a venue where they could kind of say, hey, you know, we don't have to rely on the gatekeepers anymore. We'll put on our own shows here and maybe we'll open up the doors to people that wouldn't be able to get into a show somewhere else. You know, not only were they doing that at that space, but that did become the headquarters for their educational programming. So kids that were in the city that, you know, were interested in, in an art form, be it um, poetry, be it painting, be it music, be it theater, they could come there and learn. Um, and it also became a spot where they would have these weekly forums that were political forums about what was going on, not only in the city, but nationally, and what could be done about it. So I think, you know, again, that gets back to this kind of do for self. If the venues don't exist, or if the venues are closing their doors, you find your own doors, you create your own doors. And I think they did a great job of that. Were you aware that there were similar groups um, like BEG across the country, or was that something you discovered as you worked on your project? So I had heard of the National Black Arts Movement, and I was definitely aware of that. Um, but it's interesting that I had not heard of BEG. I didn't know the you know history of the St. Louis chapter that was right here. So, yeah, I mean, that was another really, that was a driving force to kind of do this documentary. I feel like St. Louis is notorious for kind of sweeping its history under the rug. You know, we hear about the movements that go on in larger cities, whether they be in New York or in Chicago. But unfortunately, the St. Louis story is usually the one that gets looked over. And the St. Louis story, for Bag, it was far more interdisciplinary than its, its counterparts in other cities. That's true. I mean, they're kind of acknowledged as the truly multidisciplinary uh, chapter of the Black Arts Movement. And so I think that that's unique and that, that makes it something that, you know, it, it deserves some respect. I was amazed how many people you found who were still alive to talk about it. Yeah. Well, you know, a number of people had passed before we started and a number of people passed while we were filming. Um, but it, it goes beyond the people that we got on camera. Um, you know, the true bag story, I think, is one that we couldn't capture. This isn't a historical comprehensive document of the organization. You know, to really dig into the bag story, you see that there were so many artists that were involved that weren't mentioned here, 
Um, I mean, everybody truly had a different experience, a different story, a different idea of who the original members were. I mean, it was kind of something that's kind of hard to categorize in a way because it was just, it was, there were a core group of people that were living their, their lives in a way that attracted all of this creative energy and attracted all of these people that were inspired to go on and do things not only artistically, but politically. But you quickly see that, you know, sometimes there's a disagreement about if somebody was a true member or not. Um, I mean, there were so many people kind of coming through the doors of the bag headquarters on Washington Avenue um, that it's really kind of, it's hard to put into a regular, uh, documentary format. Um, it's hard to wrap your, put it all into a, a nice and tight box, I guess you could say. One of the things that fascinated me, and, and I had heard of the world uh, saxophone quartet, but I didn't realize that they were created as a result of bags, sort of indirectly. Yeah, you know, I mean, three of the key members at the time ended up forming the World Saxophone Quartet. And I think it was, um, as you hear Oliver Lake say in the documentary, he kind of took the lessons that he had learned from Bag to kind of start to uh, create a path for himself in New York. And that's kind of what indirectly uh, led to the, the formation of the World Saxophone Quartet. And I've got to give you credit for digging deep enough to find all that film. I wish we would have found more. Um, you know, we did find a few people that were here in St. Louis that had documented and then the boxes of documentation just sat in their basement. And so as we started to collect interviews and kind of follow the leads that people would say, hey, you know, check with this guy. I know he was at this show and he had a camera. You know, we luckily we started to uncover this stuff. And the funny story is, is I've gotten a couple of emails after the documentary aired at the St. Louis Film Festival of some other possible leads, some other documents that might exist. So it's surprising because I think their bag was really prolific at the time. I mean, they were doing shows weekly. There's so much that wasn't documented, but I do hope that even as this airs and as we kind of say, maybe this chapter or this, this part of the documentary might be complete, we find more and we're able to kind of like supplement this, this document with more archival footage and more things that haven't been seen by the public. So we could see an update then. An I update hope so. Of- I hope so. For Living St. Louis, I'm Ruth Ezel.